Okay, Bruce, uh, here we are. Very first chat on Ag Inspire Conversations. And that's what it is, just conversations with people who I think uh, are, are doing inspiring things in agriculture. I've been very lucky to have loads of conversations with people over the last couple of years. Now I've been using Zoom. I want to start recording a few of them. And uh, I have found them talking an awful lot about parasites the last couple of weeks. So who better to start this conversation with than a, good, a farmer and a good friend of mine, fellow Nuffield scholar, uh, Bruce Thompson. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning, Tommy. How are you doing? Good, good, Bruce. How are things down in Leash? The sun is shining. sun is shining, the grass is yellow, <laughs> and there's dust everywhere. <laughs> Did you get much rain, Bruce? No, we got nearly nothing. Only, only a couple of mil. Okay. So you're, you're in need of rain? Yeah, I have, we haven't seen a wet day here now since, uh, since March. So, yeah, um, it's, been, it's pretty dry. <laughs> Bruce, I'm going to talk to you about parasites and particularly what's interesting is what you're doing on your farm. But just before that, give people a little bit of background to yourself. Uh, you're a dairy farmer. What's, give me some information on your own farm. Yeah, OK. So I'm working at home with my dad and a farm manager, Nick. And uh, we have expanded with the abolition of quotas from 54 cows up to 230 this year. Um, yeah, so we're, we're stocked pretty well on, on the grazing platform at 3.4 cows to the hectare. Um, so we're pushing cows um, to uh, produce high solids milk from grass, basically a grass-based diet. Um, the other two groups of animals on the farm then are heifers between one and two-year-old and uh, young calves then as well. So we've three, we've three animals on the farm basically. And before we get into kind of parasite control, because that is your, your real area of interest, what are the challenges you've found this year from an animal health perspective? Um, or has it been a pretty good year other than it's been very dry for the last five, six weeks? Um, okay, so I suppose inside our gate, the, the spring was, was very, uh, the ground there is quite heavy, so the, the spring really didn't suit us. Um, it was very wet. Um, so we were, we were finding trouble trying to get uh, enough energy into, into cows, keeping them full in, in February and March and trying to keep them content. Um, yeah, we, we had a, bit, a couple of issues then with uh, high potassium silage and um, causing E. coli um, and you milk had fever. You mastitis because of milk fever, sir? Yes, <laughs> correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we, that, we knocked that on the head by supplementing magnesium at the time. Um, moving on then, Everything was fine once weather dried up until maybe a month ago. We, we got a peak out. We had um, cows pining for phosphorus. So um, you, you were talking about that, Tommy, I know at the time. Yeah, the thing I see this year, Bruce, actually, was milk fever was a massive issue in dairy cows in Ireland. And peak, obviously, over the last four or five weeks. I wrote an article on peak because I've seen so much of it. And it was the most viewed article I've written this year. Uh, so it is a big challenge, uh, but I think the milk fever really worries me a little bit. I think we need to start honing in on that subclinical hypercalcemia really in the dry period. I think it's something we need. To, you identified high potassium. If we know this, you know, six weeks out from calving, we can really alter our minerals to try and get, get that under control. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's something we're, we're definitely more conscious of coming up to calving now next, next, uh, next season anyway. Um, yeah, peak it in. Yeah, we, we started supplementing phosphorus. And like I'd say, within three or four days of, of supplementing, the, the cows stopped eating the shirt off her backs, literally. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, other than that, things have been pretty good in, in terms of animal health. A uh, bit of coccidiosis with the calves, um, which is a bit, we're, we're kind of finding it a difficult one to battle. But um, yeah, that's, that's just something we, we're going to have to uh, stay battling with, I think. Um, you've the map of the globe behind you and you've done a lot of traveling post-COVID uh, or pre-COVID should I say because yeah. uh, you were doing your, your no-field travels um, and I suppose that, that no-field topic that you're doing, tell us what it is. Okay so basically um, I'm looking at um, addressing the issue of animistic resistance using uh, the possibility of, of a biological method of uh, dung beetles to uh, fight parasites. Okay, and tell me about you and the dung beetle before we get into the role of the dung beetle. What got you interested in the biology of parasite control over sort of maybe our traditional chemistry models where we used antimentics for years? How, how did you get interested? Um, well, I suppose it, it started maybe about 10 years ago. Myself and my dad were uh, on our, our routine, monthly routine dose on the calves, and it seemed like we seemed to be using more and more dosing. Um, 
and we decided at that time, you know, that because he hadn't had to do as much in the past of it, that there, there was something different, there was something happening. Um, so we, we thought at that stage that the animals, uh, uh, their own immune system wasn't battling parasites because um, we were using too many mectins on the farm. Um, the mectins, you're talking about the macrocytic lactones, the ivermectins. Correct, your ivermectins and your bimectins and, and all those products, yeah. So we, we, um, we at that point, decided to take a more of a diagnostic approach to um, to dosing so um, and stopped using the mectins at that, at that point. Um, so we, we were rotating in the calves the, the, the Vasimol and the Benzimidazole products, so that's your, your yellow and white trenches. Um, and I suppose a chance conversation with an entomologist about animatics uh, about three or four years ago, got, sparked my interest in, in this beetle. She, she was adamant that the dung beetles were, were actually more prolific on my farm now because it was using less, less animatics. And yeah. went out to dung pads and kicked them open, and lo and behold, here were, were the, the dung beetles in my dung pads. So from that moment on, I was hooked. So big thank you to Sally Ann Spence. From the UK yeah, for that was one. the person who kind of sparked your interest in this, and, and uh, is the theory that if you're using macrocyclic lactones, that they have an impact on dung beetle population? They do indeed, yeah. Particularly the oh, any chemicals do, but particularly the mac macrocyclic lactones have um, a, a negative effect on reproduction of the of the the dung beetles, um, them and uh, deltrometrins, which are your, your spot on for flight control. Um, and your cyclometrins have, have, a, have a negative effect on populations as well. So we'll talk a bit about them again because we're coming into flight control. So the dung beetle, it's not the dung beetle that is directly involved. So the dung beetle is, is involved obviously in soil health. Uh, and what role then does the dung beetle play in parasite control on your farm, your typical farm? Okay, so we are looking at two types of dung beetles in Ireland. So there's, there's about there's somewhere between 40 and 60 species, but they're, they fall into two, two, two types. So we have burrowers and dwellers. So the, the burrowers literally get the dung and pull it down into the ground and bury, bury it into the soil. So in, in that effect, they, they're removing the dung and the parasites from the pasture into the soil. The, the, the parasites can't get into the they can't complete their cycle when, when they're going into the soil. The ones that live in the pads actually don't eat the, the dung pads, which is what, what we think they do, but they actually drink the, the, the liquid out of it. They're after the bacteria in the liquid. Okay. So in doing so, they, they dehydrate the dung pads. Okay. Um, so in dehydrating the dung pads, they're dehydrating the parasite eggs. And as parasites are, are aquatic, they can't move to the dung pat then and get onto the onto the grass and also the dung pats are then more appealing to earthworms so when you see a dung pat half dried and you, you kick it open and you see all these earthworms just underneath the underneath the dung pat that's because that's because the dung beetle has um had to dry it out and made it more appealing to them so this is all part of nutrient recycling in your in your in your, in your, in your, in your farm basically yeah so they're they're then bringing the the dung pat down the dung pat before is is basically a noxious, noxious weed on top of the soil. Okay. When it's pulled into the into the soil, it, it's a high valuable nutrient at the roots of the grass. Um, okay. So you have your phosphorus and potassium and nitrogen there, ready for the grass to grow again. And when you say about the dung beetle, because I've been on your farm and it's a, it's a great visit because you, you have your, your farm office, it's like a little lab with your, uh, you have every piece of equipment, you've eBay rated, you have microscopes, you have all these measuring equipment. A scene from Breaking Bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but you, 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 you brought me out onto, far, onto, the, onto the farm, obviously, we looked through dung pads and you showed me these uh, dung beetles with these things called phoretic mites on the dung beetles. And yeah. you were explaining to me that it's the phoretic mite who's a host, or the dung beetle is a host for these phoretic mites. The phoretic mites actually scavenge the eggs, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, the phoretic mites will eat any um, uh, basically living tissue. Um, so they actually they, they search out for these um, uh, parasite eggs and they'll actually consume them. Um, so that, that's where the, the, big, uh, the big advantage is um, with the dung beetle. Is, is that they actually carry around these phoretic mites with them from one path to another. So that they have a, a symbiotic relationship. The, the dung beetles don't want the um, they don't want the parasite eggs in the in the dung pads because basically 
the the parasites make the they make the uh, dung paths taste like shit. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So they they have a, th this understanding then the the uh, the, the phreatic mites know when the dung path the dung beetles are going to leave the dung path, and they collect them up uh, on onto the bellies of the of the beetles, and they fly from one path to the next, and then they release the release these these little mites. They can be seen, they're on every farm, they can be seen, they're, they're very evident there. If you can find a, a dung beetle, pick it up and look at the underside of it, it it'll have these tiny little, little mites on it. It's amazing. So there's all this kind of biology going on in sh shite, basically, yeah? And uh, on our farms that we like, like that I didn't know anything about until I talked to you, obviously. So uh, how, how, how do farms evolve? How does this evolve if we're going to, because our new medicines directive from the EU is, is less antibiotics and probably less antibiotics when you dig into it as well. Um, we have a big issue with resistance. So the type of stuff that you're, you're talking about is really interesting to me because it's, it's helping farms evolve to use less antimentics. I think we still need them, but use them less. So, so how does this story of the dung beetle, how do we get more dung beetles onto farm? Is that what you're looking at, Bruce? Is that what the, the aim of this is, is to how we increase the dung beetle population, reduce our parasitic burdens this way as one part of it? Yeah, so yeah, by reducing um, animetics, particularly the macrocytic lactones and uh, the deltrometrins and cypermetrins, um, th those are, are the three, the three uh, problem chemicals when it comes to uh, dung beetles. They, they were the, the three biggest, um, I suppose, steps people can take is, is to, to reduce those. Um, well, other steps you can When you said that, and I know from my experience, um, and we talk about labor on farm being a challenge. We talk about, you know, making life easier for ourselves if we can at all. These products have become really, I suppose, have made the job of parasite control easier. Now, I know there's a lot of resistance developing to them, but it is a challenge when you say to people, you, you, we're all, and I, and I think parasites are actually getting more complicated, but you're telling people things, you know, you have to make life a little bit more complicated to get these results. Yeah, that, that is correct, yeah. Um, I suppose that the products are they're, uh, when, when you go to your merchant, you don't say it, but they're they're quite cheap uh, in comparison to to the alternatives. Um, there's no point in saying anything else. But I, I suppose from uh, to be responsible about it, if, if an animal is diseased with worms, it needs to get an animitic. Um, but you want to make sure that animitic is going to work when you use it. So really what we have to do is know when to use it and what product to use um, as, as opposed to having a set plan coming up to a, a grazing season of, of what products we're going to use. Because like I'm, going to date, I'm going to dose in May, I'm going to dose in July. So, Correct, yeah. So the dung beetle is one part of the story. I know that you've bought a microscope on eBay, you've got pictures of every different parasite known to, to, to man on your walls, your office. Talk to me about what you're doing on farm or on faecal egg counts and how that ties into it. Yeah, so we, we would take a, a faecal egg count maybe once a fortnight and um, depending on that then uh, we, we know if there's a, a, approximately 250 eggs per gram in, in a sample of a particular um, parasite, we will know then what, what uh, drug to use and uh, if it needs to be used in the first place, but what drug to use as well. So we, we will use maybe the... The, for example, if it, if it was lungworm, we would use a, a levazimol product, okay. leaving the leaving the likes of a benzimidazole um, till later on because the the levazimol will cover the lungworm, but it won't cover tapeworm, for example. So we will know the next time if I get tapeworm, I can use my benzimidazole and it'll cover the tapeworm, or it'll cover the lungworm again if if I need to go the second time with it. So we'll use the the least. I suppose the least comprehensive um, animintic that we know will work on that day. Um, if it Are you be. rotating your animintics in the season yes. so it's not year to year? Uh, no. Different ways of doing it. I would say to some farmers use a product this year and maybe rotate within the year and in certain farms. And this is a challenge, Bruce, is that every farm is slightly different. There's, there's no template. I know you've done a lot of traveling. There's, and we, everyone, if anything I would have been asked for was one thing is give me a parasite control plan that I can just use in all, a, a number of farms. Every farm is slightly different. So you're rotating your warmers within the season. Um, talk to me then. So you're using faecal egg counts. You're, you're, you're looking at your dung beetle. Um, where are you as regards antimentic use in your farm and your first grazers, second grazers and your cows? 
Okay, so um, our, our cows, I suppose, well, no, I'll start with the calves because they're the youngest. Yeah. Um, so they, they have gotten, last year, they got three doses during the summer. Um, that, that was in total. Now, not including uh, Taltazoral, which is a coccidia stat, um, which they got in housing um, in that. Uh, so they got three. The heifers got, that would be my one to two year old heifers got nothing and the cows got nothing um, since 2017. The cows haven't got, gotten anything. So you've got that immunity developing by the looks of things uh, as regards. Are you, are you still managing uh, fecal egg counts in your second grazers? Are you using them in your cows as well? Yeah, we do indeed. We just keep an eye on it with the cows. Um, we have, of course, the, the herd health screening there with Lambia for the, that comes in the milk. It, it, it's a, an, an antibody test in, in the milk that comes, um, I think it's quarterly. Okay. Um, yeah, we're watching that as well. So that's, yeah, they're, they're, they're the, I suppose, the diagnostic protocols. Um, in terms then, I suppose we, we, we kind of have, we, we kind of skipped maybe a fork group that might, might consider on the farm we purchased in two bulls for the heifers this year so all the heifers were AI'd on the one day synchronizing AI'd on the one day and waited a few days and let out two bulls but you have to remember too that that animatic resistance is also it's genetic and can be it's a genetic trait within parasites and can be purchased into the farm so with the two bulls of unknown um animatic usage um we quarantined them before they got came out came out to pasture. So, what we don't want on our farm is a parasite that is resistant to levazimol or benzimidazole. So what we do is we keep those two bulls in, um, and they're given all three gr drug groups indoors, okay. and they're allowed to pass out all these parasites before they go out to pasture. So it, it, basically, it's, it's ensuring us that. Uh, our, the products that I want to use will work in future. Um, Very good, so. because the, the bought-in animals are always the risk for disease. I mean, whether it's parasites, lameness, cell count, anything you name it, I mean, they're going to harbour the disease. So it's very interesting because it's so easy to put down the back of the trailer, let the animals out, and the job is done. There, there is more work to quarantine. There is more work to what you're talking about. I suppose the final piece of the picture that I'd be aware that you're doing is looking at grazing management. And I saw something that you shared recently, and I know you were in the Irish Times, which are your beetle work. Uh, it was an article on the Irish Times about what you were doing. But you were looking at grazing management, and I thought it was fascinating. Um, now, it seemed like work, but it's, I mean, the detail that you've got into around paddock risks. Talk about that. Yeah, so we have, uh, so it, it, I, I suppose I, I, uh, we, we consider the calves maybe as parasite factories on, on the farm. So if a calf ingests a parasite egg, it's going to uh, expel a far greater amount of eggs than, say, a, a dairy cow. So a cow's own immune system is able to, when she has a good working immune system, is able to suppress the, the uh, parasites from reproducing in, in, in the rumen. Um, but a calf doesn't have that same immune system. It has to build up over time. So basically, as a calf ingests a parasite, there's going to be more coming out of its back, back end. So if you rotate a calf back onto the same pasture that it has um, expelled parasite eggs onto, is going to ingest a, 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 a greater number of eggs the next time it comes around, and that's going to multiply again. So you're, you're going to, but by, by keeping calves on the same area of ground, running around the same area of ground, you're going to increase the risk and increase exposure to uh, to parasites. So we, we we came up with this idea then, uh, we call it traffic light grazing. So okay. basically we have a map of the farm um, and we. As the calves graze a the paddock, they're on green paddocks, but paddocks are marked green, and as the calves come off of that paddock, it's marked orange. Um, so as we're rotating around the, the area ground, we don't put them back onto an orange area. Um, we try to really try to avoid it. Now, it's not obviously it's not always possible, particularly a year like this where you're getting very low gr grass growths, but um, we try to avoid the, the orange areas. If we find the calves, the fecal egg count. Is, is by fecal egg counting uh, to, to kind of your fecal egg counts will determine that risk is it correct yes yeah that's correct yeah no it would always be orange but yeah um regardless of, of what 
what the fecal egg count will give us. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we I suppose to keep it simple, um, you could say just just paint it orange after the calves, regardless. Um, we we will paint it red when they fa fail the a fecal egg count. So if they go over two hundred and fifty eggs per gram. That's your cut off, Bruce, is 250. 250. I would have thought below 250 is low risk, between 250 and 700 is kind of, you look at clinical signs and you see what the animals are like. Over 750 would be my, you know, you need to dose. So you're using 250 as your marker, honey. That's our marker, yeah, that's what we use. Yeah, maybe we could we could try flying the flag a little bit higher with it, I'm not sure, but that's what we're, we've been using anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, so that the calves never come back to a red paddock, um, basically, and, and to try... The, the work then is involved in, in changing a red to an orange. We, we, we take it back one step at a time. Okay. So red to an orange, orange to green. We do that by taking a cut of silage or uh, running maybe heifers or cows onto it or, or something on those lines or leaving it over winter. Um, we take it back one step that way. Um, you, you can you can use different species there if you had sheep or, or other other animals on the farm too. Talk about different species, and I know you've read a lot about parasites more than anyone probably in the last year and a half or more. Um, what's your view on the the mixed species swards as part of maybe look? I know from a production point of view, they're they're an important story and they require certain management. But on parasites, is it something that's coming onto your radar when you're going into such depth on the traffic light system? Um, is it something you're thinking about? Yeah, it certainly is. Um, I know the, um, the, the where, where the calves currently are for us is, is actually uh, it's, it's not really a mixed species for it, but it's um, it's old grass, it's old meadow grass, um, which is actually it's easier to manage from a parasite point of view because you're not grazing it down as close and you're looking at longer rotations. Um, I, I suppose the same. That, that's probably one of the reasons that the mixed species for us are are. Um, maybe uh, more advantageous from a parasite control point of view. Um, another another factor would be the, the mechanical um, mechanical looking at, at um, the, the particular plants involved because we know that, that parasites swim off of the, the majority of them swim off of the, the, the pads Pads if, your dung, if your dung beetles don't get them, first of all. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if my SAS crew don't get them. Yeah, um, yeah. so they, they swim off and, and get onto, the, onto the, the soil around the pad and onto the, onto the grass. And uh, that, that damp, leaky grass then, they swim, swim up that. And when the animals graze that down tight, they'll, um, they'll ingest them. But with the multi-species wards, you're looking at higher residuals and um, you're looking at stemmier type of uh, undergrowth, um, which the animals aren't aren't actually ingesting. So there's a mechanical part of it. There's the rotation length doesn't suit the the parasite cycle as as much. So you're looking at longer rotations um, for the growth of the of the of the actual sward. But that that doesn't um, that doesn't fit in with the so much with the uh, the parasites life cycle. So you're, you're looking, you will be lowering it there from that point of view. But the nutritional end of it, then you have high tannin contents then in, in the likes of, of your chicory and your, your plantains, um, that that also helps suppress the the parasites in in the animal stomach as well. So yeah, they're, they're kind of a threefold advantage. Yeah. Now I haven't I have sold chicory on the farm here. Um, the last couple of years in, in any swords we've been reseeding, but um, I haven't got around to the a full blown multi species sword yet for, for the grazing platform for the cows, anyway. Is farming getting more complicated, Bruce? If we look at reduction yeah. <laughs> look at parasiticide, that's, you know, that's what I think about. That there's a huge amount of science to all this, and there's a huge amount of science to grazing and grassland management, anyway. And then, you know, what you're doing is adding another layer, maybe of complexity, and I think it's necessary. And I suppose this is why, you know, it's great for people like you who are forging ahead and maybe making the mistakes and learning lessons for others on it. But it is becoming more complex, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, everything you go, like, to do now, you really have to, to look into it. There's more and more complications uh, as, uh, as you start looking into it. But um, definitely it is. It, yeah, like, we, we, we can see there's... the the complexity now of, of animatic resistance coming in, so we have to we have to see what, how we're going to be able to manage. Um, should a product not work for us, um, like how we're we going to get rid of these parasites, um, how we're we going to work without it in the future. Um, I mean, it's the same with with any 
any uh, any drug that we seem to be using on the farm nowadays, even even the uh, the detergents in 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 our own parlours, um, we're now without fluorine, um, and you know we have other products there with question marks on iodine teeth sprays and other you know we're, everything is how how can we manage without these? What alternatives? How do we how do we work around it? Um, it definitely, yeah, there's, there's more com com complexity to it than there was maybe 20 years ago anyway. Come here, Bruce. One of the things you mentioned earlier on, and I'm very conscious of time with you here, is you mentioned uh, the spot-on treatments for flies, and now we're right into fly treatment time. You have your own home remedy. That's another one that I've, uh, an interesting one I've come across on fly applications to keep flies away, particularly for summer mastitis. Um, so are you, have you stopped using spot-ons? What's your protocols around managing flies? Because I know some of the farm is very close to woodland, which is big fly risk. And the weather, I was only saying yesterday, the weather is perfect for flies at the moment. We'll see a big emergence of flies in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, so where our, our heifers are is, is basically it's a fly farm. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a wood, it's, it's on the side of a mountain that's, that's south facing. It's really warm with, with wood and, and um, a lake around it. Um, so yeah, we, we have a lot of blowflies around around uh, the around the heifers. So we have to, we have to be really on the ball. But we had been in the past using daltrometrin. Last year we managed without it. Um, but suppose the spring heifers of 2018, we had 67 of them, and we calved in. I know you were out here at the time last spring. About four or five of them calved down on three quarters which we were putting down to flies at the time. Last year... That, that's where you don't see the summer mastitis in the heifer and she calves down with a blind quarter. We definitely see a lot of that on some farms. But it, we, we, you know, and you've lost a quarter, which is a huge loss. Yeah, it is. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, we didn't, have, we didn't see any clinical cases of, of mastitis in them. Um, so last year, we, we tried uh, a different approach. So we, we ditched the spot on. Now, admittedly, I had a bottle of it in the truck with me every time we went up to see them. Uh, just to be at the safe side, before, yeah. <laughs> yeah, ready to go. But we used uh, eucalyptus oil on their backs and uh, painted Stockholm tar on them. So we had 72 heifers and the 72 of them calved down with uh, four quarters. Wow. Okay. Uh, no, no, some, no cases of summertime mastitis. And talk yeah. to me then about that. So what's the protocol that you'll probably be imp implementing now? So you'll be doing the same thing again, copy success from last year. What, what's that protocol? How often do you have to get these heifers in to put on those treatments? Yeah, that, that's the awkward part. It's, it's the unattractive bit. And this, this is what you were talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, so we found that that protocol lasts anywhere from one week to four weeks, depending okay. on the weather. Now, it will, it'll, in fly weather, it'll last longer. So obviously because of it's drier, drier type of weather. Um, but it will wash off. If you get a, couple, a few wet days together, it'll, it'll wash off the, the heifers. So you have to go again with it. Um, we used, um, we have a, my, I, I robbed my wife's uh, radiator roller that she used to paint behind the radiators. Okay. And a bucket of Stockholm tar and a couple of AI gloves and we used that to paint the heifers in, in the crush. And actually it's not that hard to do. Um, it's just the, <clears throat> the matter of actually doing it, to be honest. One of, the tips, one of the tips I got recently was whether you're putting on fly preparations or not is to the swish of the tail, the hair of the tail, uh, to put the, maybe the eucalyptus on that uh, oh, yeah. to get more cover around the other as opposed to putting it, you know, it's just an extra place that we don't often think about uh, yeah. in heifers, so something to think about. Yeah, very good, yeah. And I, I challenged the, uh, the chemical companies to come up with a, a fly repellent product, not a, as opposed to a, an insecticide. Okay. Um, so if you could get, if, if, if they could engineer a product that, that had more persistence to it, um, that stayed on their backs or whatever to, to repel flies, um, it, it'd be fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Bruce, I've taken up a lot of your time. I think what you're doing is really interesting. You're, you're in the middle of your Nuffield scholarship. I'm a Nuffield scholar myself. Uh, it's a super experience, but obviously your Nuffield journey has been slightly different because uh, you were heading off on your global focus program right in the middle of, or I suppose, the start of COVID-19 and it happened really fast. How has it impacted your studies and your no-field and you know, how has no-field been for you so far, I suppose? Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly been a um, full-on uh, experience for me now. It's been absolutely amazing getting to, um, to meet all these people and, and experts and, and see things that, are, that have been, you know, I could never have imagined. Um, I, got, I saw the potential 
that we 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 would have the same potential uh, in Ireland with, with dung pads down in, in Tasmania, being able to see dung pads being taken out of pasture um, completely after three days of grazing. Wow. Um, so they have no problems with parasites. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's been challenging as well. So uh, there's no point in saying anything else. There's a lot of work with it. Um, um, but it's, it's good, the, these challenges, uh, they, they test you anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting some other people now um, as well. I, I'm, I was meant to meet some um, in the last last week actually in, in Singapore. Um, so that, that's kind of uh, <laughs> put on the, the long finger for the moment. So I'm getting to do, um, getting used to working Zoom and Teams and, and WhatsApp calls. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It's, look, it's, it's part of the new, the new world. I suppose if I look at the idea of these conversations, what Bruce is Ag Inspire, is to see people who are doing inspiring things, and you are doing inspiring things. Uh, Farming is a very inspiring uh, industry at the moment. I know we've lots of challenges. What have been your inspirations as you've gone through your farming career, as you've come back home? Um, you know, what helps you get up in the morning? What drives you on? Because there is lots of challenges. Yeah, uh, look, I... I we start early in the morning and we finish early in the evening and we work a fairly tight ship in terms of, of schedules. Um, I, I like to get in to make, see my, my wife and kids in the evening. So that's, that's been a big inspiration for me um, to, to get, get stuff done. Um, I, I, I look, I, 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 there's, there's a lot of negativity around agriculture, um, particularly in an environmental point of view. So that, that's been another, another inspiration that I'd like to see changes made in in, uh, in uh, not just the perception but in the, in the actual reality of, of what's what's happening on farms because we know look ireland's the best country in the world to be as you say the best country in the world to be a dairy dairy cow as well as a dairy farmer so um yeah it's it's great to uh, to be part of to see be part of and, and see the expansion that has gone on in, in particularly the dairy industry in, in, in the country it's, it's been absolutely phenomenal that the um the employment and, and uh, work that has, that has gone on in, in the country is, is uh, I'm actually very proud to see that happening. Yeah. Yourself and Nick are a great team as well, your farm manager and your dad is a huge part of that team. What yeah. do you put that success down to? Is it communication? Is it being clear on roles? Is it, um, is it trust? What, what's the big things to, because you, you, I've been on lots of farms and there is that tight relationship uh, there between yourself and your father and Nick. What do you put that down to? Um, look, no, um, we, we, we trust is a big thing, yeah. But um, I, no, no one has, um, no one takes the. I, I suppose the, the, the book does drop with me, but I let people make their own decisions on the farm, and I, I no problem letting um, let people challenge me. So um, you know, if, if if someone wants to contradict me on farm, that's no problem because uh, I'm not always right, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, yeah, and look, get get on very good with, with my dad, and get on very good with, with Nick. They're they're, um, they're not seen as as um, staff like really. I suppose they're they're seen as as friends. So um, yeah, we're, that's where it works. People go on do their own thing. And but, I'm, I'm going to leave you on this note, uh, Bruce, because it's been fantastic to talk to you. And you you mentioned the word challenge, and you're challenging the status quo maybe around how we manage parasites. And it's an important conversation to have. Uh, continued success with your farming and your family um, and particularly your no-field topic and research. I'm looking forward to reading your report. Where can people follow you for you know the journey of the, the Bruce Thompson journey uh, the, the, on the dung beetles and beyond? Okay, I suppose the, the best place is probably, probably Twitter, Tommy. Um, you can find me, just stick my name in the search engine, Bruce Thompson or at Frisian Man. Um, you'll find me on Twitter. So that's probably the best place to look me up. So you're going to keep people updated on your journey and uh, and uh, look, I wish you all the best. It's been a fascinating chat. Thank you very much for, for the, the conversation, the insights in parasitology. I think uh, what you're doing is really, it's going to be interesting to see because anthelmintic resistance, I would have thought it was a sheep issue. It's a big issue on farms. I'm only two weeks old dead with a farm, a, 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 a cask farm that had issues that we didn't realize were there. So it's an important topic. Um, but I think it's important as well to highlight the positives that farming is that farming is doing at the moment. And I think you you're as excited as I am to work in, in in the Irish ag industry and maybe beyond. So Bruce, thank you very much for being the first person on to have a chat with me on this Zoom video. And I know we'll be in contact with each other again. Thanks a million. Thanks, Tommy. Cheers.